Hi, I'm Dave Pello. I'm here at the Liberty Fest conference and I'm talking with Professor James Allen. Now, you, Hi, David. you're explaining to me that you're uh, trying to enter the Darwin Awards. What happened yep. to your wrist? Yeah, I, well, you know, I was doing my best to win the Darwin Awards, which is where you, you get an award for helping the gene pool because you die in a stupid way. <laughs> I was on a ladder, a uh, wooden step ladder, probably too old, changing a high ceiling light bulb and the ladder collapsed. And uh, luckily I got my wrist behind me and didn't hit my head or back but uh, four hour emergency surgery wow. but when I landed my daughter came in and I'm writhing around and she said well that answered that answers that age-old question of how many law professors it takes to change a light bulb it's more than one <laughs> Professor James Allen is Professor of Law at the University of Queensland, Australia's seething hotbed of conservatism with roughly five or six out of uh, 40 faculty actually, about that. About that, uh, actually so. right of centre. Well, in, in the there. sense that they would, vote for the, uh, they would vote for the coalition now. I mean, I, as I said in my presentation, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure today's Liberal Party actually is a right to centre party, but let's assume it is. Yeah, sure. So that actually speaks to the nature of academia in Australia and perhaps the Western world that five or six out of 40 qualifies as the most conservative faculty in a nation? We have been described by some Melbourne academics as the raving right-wing law school of Australia, which means that 20% vote coalition, that makes us a raving right-wing law school. Right. You know, so, you know, 85% vote left, not enough for the, these people. They want, they want more. So what's it like working in a university as a conservative? Well, I've been lucky. I, I got hired in from New Zealand as a professor. I don't have to go for promotion. Um, as I said, we, we have enough uh, right of center people that everyone gets along. If you're a junior person and you're going for promotion or trying to get a grant and you're on the right of center, very hard. Um, you know, grants in the hard sciences are sort of apolitical. There's, but if you're going for a grant in the social sciences or law or business, I mean, how many people do you think in this country the ARC gives grants to who want to stop the boats, who are in favor of a traditional idea of marriage? You just go through the list of things, and if you're on the right of center, you're not getting a grant. Let's say you're against the Bill of Rights, like me. You have no hope of getting a grant from the ARC. And, you know, these people can see... the ARC? Australian Research Council. Okay. And this is money that the Libs continually fund. They fund their opponents. They don't do anything about it. You know, they're appointing Santo to the Human Rights Commission. They're appointing Milne and, and uh, Guthrie to the ABC. Um, you know, they've appointed most of the high court. So it, they deserve everything they get. Yeah. What do you think the... Is that the solution? Is changing the funding or changing the appointments to these funding well, bodies? You know, it's hard to change the universities now because they're so one-sided in a sort of political sense. Uh, in a purely, if, if we're only talking about how the universities are administered, then I would, I've always said, nobody listens to me, but what I would do is I would firstly make every university publish the percentage of people who are bureaucrats to people in the university who are teachers or researchers. And it's well over 60%. You would never run a business where the back office has a lot more employees than the people bringing in wealth or doing the core job. Mm -hmm. And I would also make them publish each university the top 25 earners and what they do. And it would all be sort of, you know, you'd have diversity divas and DVCs, PVCs, VCs. They'd be the ones making the big salary. So how, how unhealthy is it actually to have such a, a lack of diversity of, of perspective, worldview? Well, it depends philosophy. how... It depends how the extent to which you think our students are cynical. So if you're a student who comes from a house where you've got a basic right of center view and you come to university and you're doing history or you're doing politics and you're surrounded by professors who are all left wing, basically they learn to play the game. They're jaundiced, they're cynical, they spew back what they know the professor wants to hear. And in that sense, you know, it's not the worst outcome because the students get so browbeaten that they just don't take it seriously. But would it be better if they were exposed to ideas on the other side of politics? Of course it would be better. How are you going to go about doing that? Not sure. Nobody's even trying. There is talk in the U.S. right now of sort of making universities. So Jonathan Haidt is starting this... Um, He's starting this push to try to get some a little bit of balance in universities. It'll be more voluntary, and you know that might help. 
It would certainly, you know, the, the, the U.S. is just better at these things. I, I'm Canadian, so it pains me to say that. But so they have the Federalist Society, and so if you go to the law schools in the U.S., which are very left-leaning, you can name the number of right-of-center law schools in the U.S. San Diego, George Mason, UVA. Um, and the Federal Society has started, and students will get Antonin Scalia when he was alive brought in, or they'll bring in right of center people, and so the students know there are other people out there who share their views. We don't do that in Australia. Is there a solution? Can, can well, outsiders always a initiate solution. it? Can students initiate it? Well, there's always a solution. As I said in my talk, you know, it's great that John Howard tries to set up the U.S. Study Center, but why he thought attaching it to the University of Sydney was a good idea is beyond me. You've got, I don't know, 28, 29 academics. Not one of them supported Trump. Not one of them predicted Trump would win. You know, they are, without exception, left-leaning. And now you've got a guy who gives a lot of money, what's it called, the Ramsey's Western Civilization thing? And that's a great thing, right? But they're linking it to UNSW. So how do they think this is going to play out? You know, they, they've got all they've got this great amount of money for a great idea, and they're linking up with the UNSW. Mm. Well, you know, it could turn out that it's a bastion of uh, balance in the university system, or it could be captured the way the U.S. Study Center is. I know which way I'd be betting. So, is there? laws that you would suggest need to be changed? No, I'm not an affirmative action guy. I would not pass a law that say you have to bow because A, they'd game the system. They'd end up picking Amanda Vanstone and saying she's your conservative or something like that. It's totally gameable, and I don't like affirmative action anyway. So you can't do it that way. But you do, I think, have to... I think over a certain age in Australia, people remember, who went to university, they remember what university was like in the 1970s, and that's not what it's like today. It's not like that anymore. What's changed? Well, the, the ratio of, of balance in the, in the non-hard sciences of med school is, is massively different. It's, the progressive left have captured the universities. There are exceptions, but they've captured the universities, and that's what, so they spew out, um, you know, apocalyptic climate notions, they spew out, um, you know, border change, border protection is bad, that sort of thing. Explain for me what you were talking about before we, we started rolling the cameras about the sovereignty of nations. Oh, well, you were asking, you were asking about um, national sovereignty. I'm a, I'm a national sovereignty guy. I think it has good consequences, uh, all things considered. I'm not in favor of EU-like supranationalism, which it fundamentally, its fundamental problem is it's undemocratic. You look at how the EU runs. Now, the EU is a club for democracy, so at the domestic level, you have to be a democracy to join. But the EU itself is not a, you know, it's very enervated. Parliament can't, you know, initiate legislation. Um, it's a top-down bureaucrat-run thing. It makes Hong Kong look more democratic. I think if you compare Hong Kong today to the EU, just how the EU runs itself, it's very democratically deficient. And that's, in my view, why most people who voted for Brexit voted for Brexit. I would have voted for Brexit. Um, you know, they, it, people try to paint it as a racist, anti-immigration thing. It's, it's a desire to uh, have an element of self-government. So when I'm in the U.S. talking about Brexit, I say, would you have supported the American Revolution, you know, the War of Independence? Because in terms of money, good, good there's comparison. a much better argument to be made for staying in the British Empire. Economically, it would have been better for decades. Mm -hmm. The reason Americans wanted out, and it was you know, a close-run thing, but you know, slightly more wanted out than wanted in, was self-government reasons. Now, you know, if that's, if, if as an American that's a good thing, then how do you oppose Brexit? I don't know. Mm. Or, you know, I, I mean, I'm Canadian and my ancestors are United Empire loyalists. They were the Americans who fled, went up to Canada. So if you, you know, want to join me retrospectively, I welcome, welcome to the United Empire loyalist cause. I mean, I would have been a, a loyalist at the American Revolution and I, I Brexit here, here because the argument for Brexit is much stronger than it was. Um, so you were... You were, you were trying to explain to me the origins of, of national sovereignty. Well, one of the things that happened with all of the sort of uh, wars between the Catholics and the Protestants was they realized that they weren't getting anywhere, and one way to do it was just to have national borders that were more or less inviolable. So if one king wanted to have a Protestant country, they just left him alone, and if another wanted to have Catholic, they left him alone, and that got rid of a lot of the wars and the killing. Okay. 
makes it, and it makes and so until that was until the Second World and War, states started separating. Well, that and also the idea that other countries didn't look into the internal affairs of a country. You know, the Second World War gave us reason to to want sometimes to intrude. I think today we're probably intruding a bit too much, mm. but you know, you yeah. definitely want to move in and and deal with uh, mass murder. But some lesser things, I'm not so sure of. I don't think that uh, the way the EU is treating Greece is particularly good. Really? Yeah, I mean, you know, the Greeks need their own currency so they can devalue. Right now, they're they're in. They're in so you think one. let them go bankrupt? I would I would default the way Argentina has. It's not great, but it's better than the alternative. You're in this forever limbo where the Germans lend you money and then take it back. And then you've got high unemployment. There's despair if you're young. What's the youth unemployment in Greece? 30, 40, 50 percent. You know, they have to leave. And defaults aren't great, but Argentina defaults and actually you get things going again. You need your own currency. So I don't know that the euro has been a success. I know that's a minority view, at least, but it's mine. Is it a minority view on right of centre? Uh, no, possibly voters? not. Possibly not. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, the EU. I, I would have voted for Brexit, and clearly the majority of yep. people in um, yep. in Great Britain did. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. And Thank if you. you want a book by Professor James Allen, head to Connor Court Publishing, and uh, there's plenty of good reading there to help us be smarter voters. Okay, and we'll high five left-handed. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the secret socialist uh, goodbye. That you know, we didn't we didn't know that until recently. Okay. Thanks, David.